uh, and thank you to SciLife Lab and Science for inviting me to this amazing uh, symposium and to the Wallenberg Foundation for supporting this. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, today I'll be talking about my thesis work, uh, mapping the brain from molecules to networks. So this is a combination of developing new approaches to understand how the brain pr produces behavior and then applying those approaches to understand the very specific type of behavior, uh, thirst. So the production of motivation as a function of an animal's need for water. So my PhD was in systems neuroscience, which is the sort of subfield of neuroscience that tries to understand how activity in networks of cells in the brain produces different types of behavior. And I just want to open with this slide because I think it sort of highlights some of the challenges on a technical level and also on a conceptual level in trying to achieve these goals of systems neuroscience. Uh, and the problem really is that the brain operates on a variety of different spatial and temporal scales. Um, so on spatial scales, the individual components of the brain range over eight orders of magnitude from you know, nanometer scale features like the synapses between individual neurons all the way up to sort of large scale connections that might span meters. Similarly, on a, t on a temporal scale, neural activity varies over 15 orders of magnitude, ranging from microsecond patterns of activity, release of synaptic vesicles, things like that, to long-term memories that can last for 100 years. Um, and so this is implemented at a variety of levels in the brain, ranging from individual molecules all the way up to sort of large-scale neural networks and ultimately behavior. And at a variety of levels, there are different types of questions one might want to ask. And so in neuroscience, there's been a big push over the past decade to developing new tools that can understand the brain at, a, at each of these different levels and try and bridge them together to gain a more comprehensive understanding. Um, and so I'll talk sort of about three vignettes from my PhD, th three different projects that approach these, the understanding of the basis of behavior at different levels and develop new techniques where I'll try and explain both the point of the technique at a broad level and how it can be broadly applied in neuroscience and also how it led to specific discoveries. Um, and a lot of this is in the context of what's called motivated behavior, which is uh, the set of behaviors that try and explain the question of why do animals engage in different actions at different times? So in nature, you look at an animal in the wild or people in a room, and you see that they'll do different things at different times. This is explained by variables in the brain that we call internal states, which cause them to, you know, at a certain time, eat food, drink water, uh, parent their children, mate with other animals, fight, for example. Some of these are homeostatically regulated. So for example, eating and drinking are in response to a need for food or a need for water. Others are in response to specific, specific stimuli. For example, fighting, you see another you know, animal that is uh, acting aggressive towards you or escape, you see some sort of threat uh, to your environment. And so the general conceptual framework for how these uh, motivated states are implemented in the brain are that there are specific needs. And in particular, this is true for homeostatic uh, motivated behaviors where there's some uh, physiological deprivation that the animal is experiencing. These are sensed by what are called interoceptors, which are specialized sets of cells in the brain that detect the in internal environment uh, in the body, the physiological state of the body, and try and sense some deviation from a set point in a particular physiological variable. Um, as I'll explain for thirst, for example, this could be the blood pressure, the osmolarity of the blood. Uh, for hunger, it could be some sort of signal related to the metabolic status or the need for food. These interoceptors, which you can imagine as like, for example, the, the retina of the body. So they're, they're particular sets of neurons that look inside the body, detect specific things, and then send signal to the rest of the brain that particular behaviors need to be engaged in in order to obtain whatever is needed as a function of the deviation from some physiological set point. Um, and it's been found over many, many years of study that there are distinct populations of neurons in different parts of the brain that seem like they control specific motivated behaviors. So you can find part, either specific neurons, dep depending on the level of analysis, or even just specific parts of the brain that control, for example, drinking, feeding, sex, aggression, fear, and thermoregulation. So this is all evolutionarily hardwired because these are all behaviors that are necessary for survival and reproduction. And so when I began my PhD, I was very interested in using thirst as a model system to study the mechanisms underlying these motivated behaviors in a very precise and defined way. Thirst is very convenient because it's very easy to induce in mice. Uh, you know, you take a mouse, you don't give it a water bottle for a day, 
and they're basically willing to do almost whatever task you want them to perform. So this is a way we commonly motivate animals in the lab. For example, if you want to study learning and memory, or uh, you know even just simple types of behaviors where you need them to, like for example, reach for a, a lever to study motor control. Uh, however, at the time I started my PhD, it was very unclear uh, at the fine scale what the specific cells were in the brain that were controlling thirst, uh, how the activity of these cells produced the, the behaviors where animals would go out and seek water or cause them to do some other behavior in order to get water, uh, what the motivational mechanisms underlying this control behavior was, and then sort of what the transmission from those cells that might sp be specific for sensing the particular need for water to some other arbitrary behavior that allows them to eventually get that water. Um, and the problem was that the neurons that were thought to control these or sen sense the need for water and control these behaviors were in a specific part of the brain that was generally known to control this type of motivated behavior, but it was very heterogeneous. So there were different neurons in this one part of the brain that controlled seemed like they controlled thirst, thermoregulation, parenting behavior, many different things, and they were all intermingled together. And there was no clear way of genetically or otherwise experimentally accessing the specific set of cells that would control thirst and not some other behavior. Um, and so we knew generally what the part of the brain was. We knew that there were certain populations in other parts of the brain uh, that probably sensed these things, but it seemed like there was this convergence point at this one particular brain region called the median preoptic nucleus, or MMPO, where different signals related to the physiological state of the body were integrated, and that's where the sensation of thirst was really produced. Um, and so in order to access this set of neurons within this very cellularly heter heterogeneous part of the brain, we developed a new tool, which we called TRAP, or TRAP2, because it was actually the second version <laughs> of the TRAP. The original version didn't work very well. Um, that allows you to permanently genetically label subsets of neurons that are active within some time window. So when neurons fire action potentials, they turn on a subset of genes called immediate or early genes or activity regulated genes. In particular, one has been very extensively studied called FOSS. So FOSS is a gene that's induced when neurons are above a particular level of activity. And you can make a transgenic mouse that then turns the expression of this gene into permanent genetic expression of some other transgenic construct. And the way you do this is you create an in-frame fusion of FOSS with this Cre-ER protein that normally sits in the cytoplasm, but then when in the presence of the drug tamoxifen will translocate into the nucleus and cause recombination in some other gene, which then is permanently expressed. So this allows you to mark cells in a permanent way, uh, basically with the logical and between expression of the FOSS gene and the presence of the drug tamoxifen, which you can inject systemically. And so as a first experiment, what we did was uh, label the specific set of cells in this medium preoptic nucleus uh, in mice that were deprived of water. As you can see um, sorry. on the right, in control mice that are just normally have their, their water in their cage, you inject this drug and you don't really see anything. You see a few random scattered cells. But then when you take away water just for 24 hours or 48 hours, suddenly you see this very specific population of cells in this one particular part of the brain light up and essentially nowhere else in the brain. So these are the cells that are probably responsible for thirst. And then we could study them in a variety of ways that I don't really have time to go into. But at a high level, what we can do is use some of the optogenic tools that were previously mentioned, where using light, we can turn on or off specific subsets of neurons to activate or inactivate these neurons show that when they're inactivated, mice will not consume water even though they should naturally be thirsty. When you activate them in a mouse that normally has full access to water, they'll go and seek out and consume water or even learn some arbitrary behavior in order to consume water. Um, it's intrinsically motivating, so they find the activation of these neurons aversive. They'll avoid the side of the box where these neurons are stimulated. And in fact, you can use the reduction of activity of these neurons to train a mouse to press a lever. So if you continuously stimulate these neurons and then whenever they press a lever, reduce the stimulation of those cells, they'll actually learn to do that task. And then finally, we showed that uh, the natural activity of these cells tracks their water consumption in real time. So as animals uh, are, as they're water deprived, the activity of these cells is at some level. And then as they gradually consume water, the activity of these neurons changes and then at a certain point, it stops changing, and that's when they stop engaging in thirst-motivated behavior. So the idea is that these cells directly encode the motivational state of the animal. As they consume water, the activity of these cells is modulated in real time, and there's sort of a feedback loop where the aversive signal of these cells over time reduces, and that 
reduces their desire to perform some behavior in order to get water. So this is what's called a drive reduction mechanism uh, for how this neural circuit controls thirst-motivated behavior. Okay, so then the question was, this is one small, very hardwired part of the brain that is very specifically responsive for thirst or for water deprivation. How is it the case that actually these neurons in one part of the brain can control neurons in the rest of the brain to allow it to actually you know, sense some stimulus in the environment to see that there's water there, to respond to some cue, to engage in some motor action that allows it to go and actually consume the water or find it and then consume it. And so we knew that this subset of neurons actually projects very broadly in the brain. So this, these neurons are in one part of the brain called the hypothalamus or the medium proptic nucleus, but they send their axons out very broadly to many different parts of the brain that are known to be involved in sensation, in action, in you know, other types of motivated behavior, things like that. It was very unclear actually uh, if there was sort of a specific node where these neurons were intervening in their regulation of behavior, since it seemed like they were kind of being broadcast very broadly. Um, and so we needed to develop a new tool to be able to study these distributed neural networks throughout the brain, instead of focusing in on a particular circuit, like for example, the thirst neurons, to actually look at activity throughout the entire brain as an animal is engaging in behavior and understand how these motivated behaviors are implemented as brain states and not as the activity in specific populations of cells. And so fortunately, around the time I started this project, there was a new technology that was developed over many years by a consortium that sort of brought uh, electrophysiology into the 21st century. So since the 1960s, people have used what's called extracellular electrophysiology to record the activity of single neurons in awake behaving animals with very high uh, temporal resolution. So you can stick a very fine electrode into a brain, it'll sit next to a single neuron and you can record the action potentials of that neuron as an animal is you know, doing some behavior or sensing some stimulus. And there was a project that was launched maybe five or six years ago or longer now that uh, use modern microelectronics tools to build basically parallel versions of these uh, extracellular recording arrays. So this is a single piece of silicon that has hundreds of recording sites on it in the tiny, basically, needle that you can stick into the brain. And this, for the first time, allows you to record simultaneously from several hundred neurons with single cell and single spike resolution at, with millisecond or microsecond temporal resolution. And so, I took these probes, which have recently been developed, and developed an approach where we could really perform sort of systematic mapping of activity throughout a large part of the brain. And the way we did this was we would, I would record from different animals performing the same behavior at different times, and for every time I inserted the electrode, I coded it with a die, where after the fact, after the, we had done the behavior and recorded all the activity, I could kill the mouse uh, and then image its brain in 3D on a light sheet microscope and reconstruct where the electrode had been inserted. And then you can register all the brains together computationally and in 3D basically figure out where every single neuron that you recorded from was likely to be in a three-dimensional volume. And in this way, build up a spatiotemporal map of activity averaged across many animals over its entire brain. And so in this case, as I'll say, in a, using a thirst motivated, be, motivated behavior, I recorded 24,000 neuron, individual neurons across 34 brain areas uh, in 21 mice, which was at the time, or maybe still is, the largest single electrophysiological recording that's ever been done. Um, so usually these experiments uh, record maybe like a few hundred neurons and that takes months of work. This is orders of magnitude larger and in a single, basically in a single experiment. Um, and so I applied this technique to understand thirst mode behavior in a slightly different way where now I have a mouse that's head restrained, so we can insert the electrode into different parts of its brain, and then it's performing a task where it's consuming water gradually over time. As it drinks more and more water, it's, they're water deprived at the beginning, they consume water over time, they gradually become sated and stop performing the task. And so the question is basically what's happening in their brain both when they're thirsty and they're willing to do this you know, arbitrary task where they smell a smell and lick for water, and then what's changing in their brain over time as they're consuming water and eventually stopping to respond to the same cue. Um, and so I think the first thing that was really surprising when we recorded in this behavior was that there was essentially neural activity everywhere I looked. So every t everywhere, anywhere I put in the electrode, you could find cells that were modulated by this behavior. And in fact, almost 50% of the cells I recorded throughout the brain uh, were task modulated in some way. So they just, if you put an electrode anywhere, there were cells that were active uh, in this behavior. And there was specificity. So there were some 
sets of cells in different parts of the brain, depending on where you're reporting from. If it was a sensory area that were more selective for the sensory cue itself, in the motor area is more selective for the motor response, but really there was like a huge spectrum in between. Um, and so it really seemed like the production of this behavior was much more of a brain-wide uh, state or a, a product of brain-wide activity than anyone would have previously thought, and that was very surprising. And the other surprising thing was that, moreover, so you might expect, okay, the mouse is doing some complicated behavior, there's lots of parts of the brain that are involved, maybe that's, you know, whatever, that's what you might expect. Um, even more surprising was the fact that also anywhere, essentially anywhere we recorded, we could find individual cells whose resting activity, so not correlated with the behavior, uh, track the satiety state of the animal. So as the animal would get thirstier and thirstier, this just sort of spontaneous firing rate of these cells would vary over time and would encode whether the animal is willing to perform the task or not. So there's a distributed brain-wide representation of the animal's motivational state, not just in these neurons that are selective for, or, or very specific for encoding thirst motivation, but actually everywhere in the brain. Um, and we were able to show that essentially this uh, state was causal. So we could reactivate the thirst neurons and reintroduce the state, turn on the behavior again, and then reintroduce the state, and exactly the same neurons that would naturally have activity while the animal is thirsty and performing the behavior, or that seem to encode the thirst motivation themselves, would be returned on when we artificially stimulated these neurons. So it seemed like it really is sort of a causal mechanism where this specific set of neurons is broadcasting this information throughout the brain, and that's broadly modulating many neural circuits to produce this brain-wide activity state that implements this particular behavior. And I think that normally in neuroscience, people study individual parts of the brain as sort of separate units that they think are implementing some specific behavior or some other behavior. But this shows that actually uh, probably the production of behavior is much more of a global phenomenon that we pre than we previously thought. I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just very briefly mention this last paper, which you can go look up if you're interested. Um, but another major question is trying to identify the cell types in the brain. So the, there are hundreds of cell types in the brain. We want to map them through, for example, single cell genomics, as Jun Cao mentioned, but also their spatial location. And we developed a technique that allows us to uh, measure the expression of up to 1,000 genes simultaneously in an intact piece of tissue um, and relate it to uh, neural activity and to other cellular features. Okay, so just in conclusion, um, we developed these different tools that allow us to study the brain at multiple levels and use this to both identify these specific neural circuits that are, very that are responsible for the production of thirst motivation and understand how those neural circuits impact the rest of the brain and produce these brain-wide states that implement the specific thirst motivated behavior. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit over time, but uh, I just wanted to thank all my collaborators uh, and my advisors, Carl Dice Roth and Lee Chun Lo. Thank you very much. Well, very nice questions for Will. Okay, I will start maybe. So, when you say thirst, I think I might have a bit of a problem with the definition of thirst. Yeah. Do you mean metabolically? when the body is dehydrated, it sends signal to brain and then it fires up yeah. neurons, or the cells generally gets dehydrated. That could also be thirst. So right? the, how, do, how would you distinguish between yeah. metabolic signal from all over the body to the brain or just the dehydration of the cells? Um, yeah, in this case, so it's, it's a, there are specific physiological signals that are sensed by a specific subset of neurons that uh, lack a blood-brain barrier, so they have they can sample the blood directly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe there are other types of sensors in cells that could sense osmolarity directly, but there's, in this case, there are specific hormones, angiotensin II, and sort of physical signals of it related to the blood osmolarity that are being sensed by specific subsets of neurons. Nice. And so that's what I mean by thirst. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No. <laughs> no questions? Okay. There is one yeah. there. 
So I was also wondering that uh, um, when we talk about thirst, for example, when it's a disease condition, some disease might have like the condition that pe patients feel dry mouth. Would this also kind of impact like the brain behavior, or it's kind of like more uh, that uh, your brain feels thirsty and then all the uh, neural cells get motivated and then you have some kind of like behavior in the human behavior level of indications? Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so there are other, there are other signal, like sensory signals that can indicate thirst and that can actually be used to manipulate thirst. So for example, like even just eating a cold ice cube or something will to some extent relieve thirst even though you're not consuming more water. So yeah, there are other signals that can impinge on it that might be affected by disease states um, that can sort of override some of these circuits that are sensing physiological variables more directly. Possibly a strange question, but is there anything in your studies that uh, relates to the uh, subjective experience of feeling thirsty and how that would, um, yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so the most we could do with that, I sort of briefly mentioned this, is we could show that the activity of these cells was strongly aversive. So, you know, subjectively, we <coughs> don't feel good when we're thirsty. And you can show that operationally in mice by basically stimulating these neurons and showing that mice will avoid the side of a box where these neurons are being stimulated, or that they'll even work to perform a task in order to turn off stimulation of these neurons. So we can't ask the mice what they're feeling, but it seems like the activity of these neurons is aversive, and part of the motivational mechanism is the reduction of this feeling of aversion by turning off the activity of these neurons. Andre, you have a question still? Uh, I was wondering about the can we, yeah. can we wait for the mic, because that's important for the online audience. Uh, I'm wondering about the trapped mice, because it also labels non-neural cells. And in your first model, do you find some uh, some cells besides neurons are also activated and uh, it's pretty specific for neurons for whatever reason. It might be some sort of regulation of the FOS gene, but yeah, in general, there's not really many glia or vascular cells or other things that are labeled. Yeah. Okay, for the sake of time, thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Well,